Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good a- I-, I hope you've, you've come to see me with your antiques. You're not the wrong event. No. <laughs> because that would be a bit of a disappointment, wouldn't it? Hello, hello at the back. Can you hear me back there? Brilliant. I'm hoping you all watch the antique shows. Oh, good, marvellous. You've all got very good taste. <laughs> no, it's lovely. So, thanks for coming. Um, if you said you watched the antiques programme, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to test you then. OK, let's test you. I'm going to start with this object here. Who owns this item? Madam, yes. OK, so do, I am assuming you know what it is. Oh, <laughs> so basically I can say whatever I like then, can't I? Hang on a minute. Arthur Negus has said... Arthur... You've brought, you've taken it already to Arthur Negus. Do you want me to confirm what he said? Arthur, ne- who remembers Arthur Negus? Yeah. That must have been some time ago, wasn't it? You're too young to remember Arthur Negus, madam. Yeah. <laughs> I'll show it around. It's a bit of a shocker. Can you see you've got this lovely maiden here? And then you turn it around and you've got that brute. So it was designed to sit in front of a mirror, wasn't it? Yeah. So it's like the two faces of this thing. So there you go. She's lovely. How do you fancy meeting him on a Friday night? <laughs> Not so good. You know who it's made by? So you've got the pretty face. And then you've got the shocker. Yeah, so it's a very unusual thing, isn't it? Now, shall I tell you what I think? And then you can tell us what Arthur Negus said. Yes? Oh, well, OK. <laughs> well, get away with it. Yeah, I, I, I can blag <laughs> this one say. dead easy. Yeah, don't worry. I'm full of confidence until it all goes wrong. So here's a trick for you. When it comes to antiques, very often the bottom of something will tell you more than anything else. So the first thing you'll see people do on TV, even if they know what it is, is just take a glance at the base because it'll give you everything you need to know. Dalton, the company, the maker, Dalton. You've heard of Dalton. And have you heard of Royal Dalton? Okay, well, this one is just marked Dalton, which tells you it was made by the firm Dalton prior to getting a royal warrant. So this is where you start looking really intelligent on TV. So I know that Dalton got the royal warrant in, you'll know this, sir. What year was it? It's just slipped in my mind. Has it? Has it? (laughs) 1901. Now you look like madam, you know the year. What year was it? 1901. Give her a round of applause. 1901. You're coming with me on every event because I'd forgotten. (laughs) So you know instantly that it was made prior to 1901. Let's have another look. Oh, there's something else on there as well. It says the country of England. What does that tell you? Well, you were good with the 1901, weren't you? (laughs) What does England tell us? It was made in England. It was made in England. I'm almost inclined to give her another round of applause for that. (laughs) It was not only made in England. We know exactly when it was or rather wasn't made in England because, again, rules of thumb, but it's pretty, pretty tight, this rule. So, you know, Dalton became royal in 1901. England, we know, was added after 1892. This is me looking so clever. It's sh- I'm even surprising myself here, madam. <laughs> so, if England, the backstamp, was introduced in 1892 and Royal was added in 1901, you can then date it between what years, madam? Those years. <laughs> She's forgotten the years already, but those years. <laughs> Exactly those years. So you're on telly and you can say confidently, first time you've seen it, 1892 to 1901. Am I looking good or what? I think so. (laughs) Dalton. But it's a very quirky sort of design, this. And I would say it's not exactly today's market. Would you agree? It's like very 1900, isn't it? and very 1980s. So in the 80s, traditional antiques were particularly popular into the 90s. 
tell me when did that genius of a man look at it? I don't remember. You don't remember? So it peaked about in the 90s. So value-wise, 1990s, I would say close to a thousand pounds. Would that be about right? I think he said 750. He said 750. It's funny how she can remember the numbers, <laughs> isn't it? Definitely. Couldn't remember anything else apart from the money. <laughs> 750,000 pounds, absolutely. But now, what's it worth today? Take a guess. Two, three hundred. I think you're about right. Two to three hundred. So people think that the world of antiques is a kind of a stuffy business. It doesn't change, but it does. It changes with fashion on a monthly basis. So now it's only worth two or three hundred, but a beautiful thing. Keep it in the family and, and keep it for generations. And then one day it will suddenly peak again. So it's a lovely piece. Round of applause for you. Give her a round of applause. Lovely thing. I'm just going to leave him there. Um, do we have any questions? Anything at all? We can talk about personal problems, madam, if you want to. <laughs> Not that you in particular look like you've got them, but it could be interesting. I don't know what to say. You don't know what to say. <laughs> any questions at all? Antique shows, people on telly, anything. Burning questions. I'm here to spread gossip. What was my most exciting find on television? Yes, okay, my most ex exciting find on television was probably something that I really shouldn't take very much credit for. And this was the very first series of the Antiques Road Trip, which must have been 11 or 12 years ago. And it was a slightly different format because we had lots of series of shows and then all of the experts on the shows came together for one big sell. We were allowed to buy one item each and we all competed in the final show. And I spent all the money I'd made in my show, my week, about 300 quid, on a Chinese carved cabinet. Now it was interesting because I've always pitched myself as an expert in Chinese things. I love the Oriental. And we in Britain and Europe have had a fascination with the Orient for centuries. You know, nothing looks nicer than a Chinese vase on an English antique table. But this thing I bought, very heavily carved cabinet for 300 quid. And I thought it was worth 500. Put it into auction, well, I got the shock of my life. I'm supposed to be an expert and know how the market is. The bidding started at 500. Six, seven, eight, nine, a thousand pounds. I doubled my money. 12, 14, 16, 18, 2,000 pounds. It sold for 2,300 pounds which made me look like an antiques rock star, <laughs> but I can't lay claim to it because we didn't know any of us that just about at that moment, and I mean literally within days or weeks, the Chinese market exploded. China is very rich. It has more millionaires in China than anywhere else. And it, they just decided to start buying back their objects. And now they're throwing money at it like there is no tomorrow. And as one Chinese dealer said to me, he said, David, we want to buy back our culture. The things that were lost to us during the 19th century, we want them back and we've got all the money in the world. And when we've bought back our culture, he said to me, we want yours. That's what he said to me. We want yours. But isn't that interesting? The Chinese market, so it just exploded. So it was a really good thing for television. Really good for me. But that was probably the most exciting moment. But I think I was like a rabbit in the headlights because I actually didn't know what the hell is going on here. I wasn't expecting it. Very good. Good question. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's find another object. Not very often do people bring weapons to an antiques valuation event. So the old police truncheons, I mean they're very collectible. Who would like to handle a police truncheon? And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Anybody? Yes, go on. Yeah, feel that. Very well balanced for obvious reasons. 
No, well, they didn't want to kill people. They just wanted to knock them out. Yeah. <laughs> but very interesting, lovely things. And of course, you know, we, we have, well, I'll test your skills again. So we've got one with uh, VR and another one uh, with VR. I'm going to make it very easy for you. So what date period then do these come from? VR, Victoria Regina. You, madam, give her a round of applause. You're going to have to stop this because you're not making me look very good at all. 1837 to 1901, Queen Victoria's reign. And they are fascinating. And what's really interesting is, bearing in mind that she came to the throne in 1837, she was really one of the very first, well, she was the second monarch, but one of the very first monarchs on the planet to reign over an official police force. Because you know this, because you're very clever. When was the Metropolitan Police Force founded? The Peelers, that's right. Any ideas? 1840? Almost, almost. Ah. <laughs> Lower. 1829, the world's first police force, the Metropolitan Police, Robert Peel. Of course, the Bobbies, the Peelers. So yeah, fascinating things, but never quite as vicious as you think they are. But lovely things, good grips on them, and very collectible, these things. What do you think they're worth? What do you reckon? Give us a shout out. 50 quid, 50 quid each, yeah. yeah, 50, 60, 80, 100, 100, 200 quid each, I would say, they're worth. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, they're just, they're beautifully decorated, very nice objects. Thank you very much, they're lovely things, lovely things. And antiques are full of stories. And I wrote a book recently about Georgians, and in fact, the Metropolitan Police come into it because the Georgian period ended in 1830, the police were founded in 1829, so they were just Georgian inventions. But when you handle objects from the past, it's a way of traveling back in time. It's the closest you're ever going to get to time travel. And some of the stories you discover are mind-boggling. You couldn't make them up. You find out such interesting things about our ancestors by handling objects. So let's choose something else. Yes. I have to go in about 15 minutes. Oh, sorry. I've had a request. Right. For the next object being this great big vase. Who has requested that? The owner of it? Yes. And, ah. and, and who happens to be? Who? <laughs> Tina, do you own that? It's Anita. So and where is Anita? She's in the bar. Hello, Anita. <laughs> she's in the bar, do you say? Yeah. <laughs> Anita, this is yours. Yes. Right. This is now all about Anita's vase. Let's see if we can make Anita rich. Yes. <laughs> right. Who knows where it's from, first of all? Japanese. Japanese, very good, this table to the left. It's definitely Japanese. Is it one on its own or was it made as a pair? Definitely a pair, yeah. Now then, when I'm gonna put it down, because it is quite heavy actually, I'm gonna put it, does anybody wanna have a look at it? When, so J Japanese, one of a pair, when was it made? Come on, you're doing so well down there. A long time ago. You're dead right there. Right. Anybody? When was it made? Take a guess. I'll give you a clue. You'll know it now. Shall I give you the period? It's the Japanese Meiji period, which lasted... Yeah, it's, yeah sounds good. Meiji period, 1868 to 1912. That's the period, and that is absolutely without a doubt when it was made. And I can tell you that because I'm going to definitely put it down. The Japanese made these things, objects for the Western market, prolifically after 1868. Prior to that, it was the Edo period, and Japan was effectively closed to the West. The Japanese said, We don't want you Westerners coming to Japan, trading with us, living here, you are ruining our culture. You're banned, barred, no trade, block the West out. They didn't like us. However, in 1868, with a change of period, a change of emperor, the Americans, back to the Americans again, 
put pressure on Japan to open up its trade. So the Japanese said, all right, we'll trade with you. The floodgates opened after 1868 and we loved it. We bought so much Japanese ware in Europe and America, it was unbelievable. And the Japanese economy went through the roof. So from almost like an agricultural background, suddenly it boomed because of trade. It was effectively a free trade, a free for all. Buying and selling economy rocketed. And that's when this thing was made after 1868. Call it 1890. Big, bold thing. And its, its decoration is called Satsuma. So it's raised. You can tell, if you close your eyes, you, you know something is Satsuma because you feel it, it almost feels like Braille as if you're reading it. Satsuma wear. And as a pair, what do you think it's worth, Anita? I don't know. I don't think it's worth a lot, really. Okay. And it, now, I mentioned the Chinese market booming, and the Chinese desperate to buy back their pieces, and they'll pay huge amounts of money. The question you need to ask yourself is this. Are the Japanese doing the same? Do they want to buy back their culture? And the answer is no. Generally speaking, no. And especially objects not made for the home market. This was made for the West. So the Japanese have less of an interest in buying back their culture. The Chinese want to buy back their culture. So the market for Japanese things is, is not as buoyant. So a big pair like that in immaculate condition would be 500, 700. As a single object, it's not just half. It's half and a bit less. And then, did anybody spot the damage? Did you? I'm going to get it back again because this is actually, actually fascinating. More than cracks. Look at that. Can you see staples? Can you see that? Yes. Staples. Yeah. Literally stapled. Very, very clever way of fixing. Isn't that amazing? Can you see that? Big staples. Now that. That, Anita, tells us something else. It tells us that it was broken, shattered very, on, very early on in its life because that form of stapling pottery and porcelain is a very old-fashioned way of fixing and incredibly clever because if they had superglue in those days, they would have superglued it, but they didn't. And you'd have traveling restorers around the country in horse and carts with wheels and grinders basically shouting, bring out your broken pottery, and they would fix them in the villages and towns as they went. But it was never cheap. So somebody really prized that thing and had it fixed. And if only it could speak, what a story. Because where is the other one? Was one shattered to beyond repair? Who knows? Who knows? But a fascinating thing. So give Anita a round of applause. And give... Give her a bit of sympathy because she's not retiring anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, always a pleasure to be at McCarthy and Stone. They always invite very genuinely lovely people. Thanks ever so much. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.